So I'm Deirdre Thornton, your moderator. Um, and we have Jeanne Burlesque. If you want to introduce yourself. Well, uh, I'm Jean Burlesque. I'm a writer from Luxembourg. Uh, so we're between the cultures, really. I always have been between the Germans, the French. Um, and so we have different cultures and different legends and different myths uh, coming and mixing together. And that's always been fascinating to me. Uh, Pedro Gulin. Hi. Um, yeah. No. no. I'm. Um, I'm. A, I'm a writer uh, from Ireland, born in Cork, uh, where we too have been, you know, between the cultures of of Kerry and Waterford and places like that, um, possibly Tipperary. Um, but yes, um, I I write scary books uh, for young people. Um, I'm doing a reading tomorrow at twelve thirty. If you if you want to hear more about that, that's me. Okay. Oshin McGann. Hi, um, I'm a writer and illustrator. Uh, I've based some of my books on the Irish legends. Um, I write for all ages, from first time readers up to um, young adults and old adults. And uh, um, I'm also interested in, in kind of storytelling and the kind of the art of it um, in, in all its various forms. So um, this is, we're going right up back to the roots of it now. And Juliet McKenna. Oh, uh, I am known primarily, I suppose, these days for writing books drawing on English myths um, and specifically the Green Man myths. Um, I grew up reading myths and folklore alongside history, alongside fantasy books. And as far as I was concerned, they were all part of the same thing. Um, this book does actually have an Irish connection in that it's the one book I've ever written where I went out for a walk in County Leash when my father was living there because my father's family are Irish um, and had a long walk through a thousand acres of Irish oak woodland and when I came back I had the complete story in my head which is uh, quite oh, a cool. even though it does draw primarily on English myth. Um, so I've been looking much more at the myth and folklore that I remember reading as a kid, which seems now to have been much less prominent in the sources that writers are using for fantasy fiction. Um, I know that, Juliet, when we were talking before the panel, you mentioned having studied Greek. Um, yes. I studied classics and what, I've, what I noticed when I was doing it and later, that when we talk about classical civilization, we talk about Greek and Roman. We don't talk about Indian or Chinese or Egyptian or Irish. Although well, I think those could be regarded as classical civilizations. We, for this, we can thank the great thinkers of the Enlightenment <laughs> and particularly the British Empire. Um, because in the, uh, uh, the focus on the classical world, Latin and Greek writers and writing, very much stemmed from the Enlightenment when the philosophers of Europe and England um, were looking for authoritative texts that were not religious. Um, it was a, they wanted to create a way of looking at the world with, as it were, the imprint, the sanction of history, the validation of great minds that had nothing to do with the Catholic Church. And that's a bias that was, first of all, inculcated into um, popular philosophy and universities and the education system. And it became so deeply ingrained that it became a, an overarching theme and influence in popular and serious literature. And I think that's something that we really do need to get away from. Because um, quite apart from anything else, if you read as much as I suspect all of us do, you very rapidly spot, oh, it's another version of a myth that I've already seen recycled 30 times. Whereas if you read a book that draws on um, myths from the Indian subcontinent, from the Far East, um, from yeah, anywhere other than Latin or Greek. It's new, it's interesting, it's different. It's still doing the same things that mythical archetypes do, 
that it adds interest and unpredictability to a story. That if it's a yet another version of um, the Norse myth that Tolkien drew on, yeah, we've been there, done that. Yeah, it reminds me of of um, when Enda, um, when one of our our prime ministers, Enda Kenny, um, won. There was some places saying, "Congratulations to the first female prime minister in Ireland," <laughs> because his name ends in A, and the assumption was because from Latin, female names end in A. Mm. And well, it's there is the a female of... Enda can be a female name as well. Yeah. I know a female Enda. <laughs> but it's just that that pervasive. Foot footprint that that Greek and Roman tradition have. Uh, you were saying, Oshin, about mm. when you were in India that there was so many different myths. No, yeah. this was in Worldcon. Um, in Worldcon, is, uh, okay. yeah, we actually had a myth building talk, uh, or not a myth in talk, but a, a talk about mythology in um, uh, in the Worldcon in Dublin, and. Uh, there was, I can't remember her name now, there's an Indian panelist, and she was just, she, actually, she had done, she studied um, Western mythology. That was her thing, like, that was her fascination. Um, so, of course, for them, this was, like, a, an extremely exotic, you know, all these kind of Western myths. Um, and, yes, you know, they have, they have so many languages in India. At, at the time, I thought there was something like 48 languages, but apparently there's even more than that. And for each of those languages, there's a different strand of mythology. Um, you know, so there's so many smaller cultures within the, within the larger ones. So it's, um, I mean, it's a fascinating thing. I was thinking about, um, I was trying to think before the panel of what we, you know, how do we would define a myth? And I think it comes down to a story that kind of can be repeated and whose essential kind of components are repeated, but whose source is basically being forgotten. Um, and when I was, uh, when I started, when I was starting out as an illustrator, um, I was illustrating, one of my first commissions was uh, illustrate a series of um, school history books. And the earlier books were using Irish mythology. They were telling the story of Deirdre and Grania and Finn McCool and, and all these. And it was interesting that within the same kind of bracket in the later books, one of the things they mentioned was Grania Whale. And of course we know, we know the history. She's a historical figure, she's not a mythical figure, but she's far enough back that she's, she's attaining a mythical status. Um, and I was really interested because, uh, first of all, these books were far more interesting than the books I'd have um, had when I was that age in, in school. Um, they're much more about stories and also, but it was also this kind of this, this kind of overlap, you know, the fact that they would have Irish mythology in a children's history book, not in a, you know, not in a fairy tales book. Um, and then you had the likes of, of Ronya Whale or Grace O'Malley, as she's known sometimes, um, who is who is a historical, very kind of you know well documented historical figure, but has also kind of been kind of almost co opted into the mythology, um, because she's such a kind of matriarchal and um, iconic figure as well. Um, so it's interesting that she kind of she's falling into this overlap. You know, she's yes. she's um, she's being adopted by the mythology world. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of it's it's always interesting to see where. You know, and also I, I'm fascinated with where, how far back we can actually trace any any kind of um, real kind of evidence of of the stories that we come, you know, we have in Irish mythology. Well, a, a part of that, if if I can um, just interrupt a little bit, is is that a lot of the a lot of the source material um, about people like Grainne Whale is not written in English. It's not written in one of the main European languages. Um, and as a result, um, you know, um, far more prominence is given, you know, to the to the to the English language sources in these things. And and it's not that there there aren't there isn't documentation about Gronuel. It's just so much of it is not in English um, that it's just it might as well not exist. Um, and so um, she kind of, uh, it's much easier to, to give her this kind of um, mythical appearance. A lot of that is Qing, um, but I remember many years ago, um, there was a, a historian called, I think Davis, something Davis. And um, he um, wrote a book called The Isles. And the idea of this history book of the Isles was that most of the history books we write now um, 
are based on the fact that we know how history came out. Mm, and so yeah. when we're looking back over history, we're looking, well, you know, Queen Elizabeth I of England was obviously a very, very important figure because basically she won and her culture won. Um, and so an awful lot of prominence is given to that. And he wanted to write a history book about the Isles, which basically included Great Britain and Ireland, um, as if we didn't know mm. who was going to win. And so give every strand equal prominence. And then obviously some will fall away as, as, as they lose out, but to try and give every strand equal prominence. And, and he failed miserably in that. Um, it, was a, it was a brave effort, but he failed miserably because he himself did not speak any of the other languages of this okay. group of islands. And so he ended up relying on English language Elizabethan sources mm. and completely disregarding anything written in, you know, Scotch Gaelic or, or Welsh or, or Irish or, or anything else. Um, anyway, sorry, I've, I've ranted. I'm stopping. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Good rant. Um, something that yeah i have read a lot of history and i have read a lot of folklore and um with one foot in each island as it were the version of english history of irish history i was taught at an english girls grammar school and the versions of irish history i learned at my granny mckenna's knee are worlds apart you know but so we you know it's commonplace that history was written by the victors i think it needs so that phrase needs to be extended that mythology is created by the vanquished yeah Jean you had a point uh, not not that important another one though um, still where mythology is concerned um, and even alternative uh, visions of history I believe our genres are doing slightly better uh, than uh, most of uh, classical or what we would call classical literature that is indeed um, often based on uh, the Latin and Greek mythology. Because in our genres, we very much have to add um, Nordic mythology. Um, Celtic mythology, even if it's only uh, King Archer and Robin Hood. And I would add to that the Christian mythology. Though, of course, even when we're trying to distance ourselves from the classical structures, classical narratives, and classical motives, it still remains very Eurocentric. Mm. Yes. Very little Chinese or Japanese. I know that... Um, very little of it, but uh, um, increasingly, I believe, increasingly, we're starting to look uh, towards them as well. Mm. Um, Aliette de Baudard writes... Oh. Quite interesting. Yeah. She uses a lot of Korean um, mythology in her stories. Vietnamese. Vietnamese. Of the Vietnamese yeah. Great, great trilogy. Yes. Uh, yes. Mixing uh, fallen angels in Paris. So you have the, uh, the Christian mythology with uh, Vietnamese uh, mythology. You have uh, dragons in the Seine. Um, I'm not sure how much I'm. That's only the. Uh, that's from the second book, uh, mostly. So. But yeah, Dominion of the Fallen, mixing um, Occidental and Oriental mythologies in a brilliant way, really. Mm. I think those books are a very good example of the uses that writers can and indeed should be making of myth, which is to look at myth because myth offers us creatures, it offers us incidents, it offers us... Um, ideas but what we need to do is to take those and then find a new context for them a context that speaks to our own lives our modern world and to create something new with them um, myths rarely actually offer a complete plot some ballads do but if you're rewriting Tamlin people are going to know pretty much how it ends I'm not saying it can't be done but you need to to be very good to do it successfully. I think far more people fail trying to just retell existing myth cycles than do it successfully. Um, I think it's a much more productive um, approach for a writer to look at myth, to look at a span of myths, 
to look at the archetypes and the issues that those myths were addressing at the time they were told and to see how you can use those elements to address issues in our own time and our own concerns. I do when think that the, the link is very important that, that Juliet was mentioning, that it has to, be, has to be linked to our own times. I mean, one of the reasons um, why, um, you know, certain stories um, like, I don't know, King Arthur and Robin Hood are told again and again and again and again and again, like every single Hollywood movie about myth is a King Arthur retelling. I mean, there must have been about 64 by now, or Batman. About seven hundred, about seven hundred of those by now, um, is I mean we we all know um, the the secret of a bestseller, uh, apart from hitting the the right note, is to give people um, a small alteration to something they are already familiar with. Mm. I mean, what one one thing you could you could go straight in there and and produce some Mongolian myths, and rewrite them or whatever um and an irish audience will just say i i don't get it why why was the sparrow important you know uh, i i don't get it I, I don't see the point of it i don't understand it it makes no sense um you 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 have to i mean you could eventually build up to the point where it would make sense and they realize the importance of sparrows or saddles or whatever but um initially um it's it has to be one step at a time, you know. If you if you want something to 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 hit home, um, and that's why um, rewriting a myth someone is already familiar with um, is is often a much easier sell, I think. It may be an easier sell, but it's a much harder thing to do well. Oh, oh, well, you know, I, I I just gave you the secret of bestsellers, but I haven't written one. <laughs> <laughs> it's been done more often, so you have to uh, find a way to, to put yourself apart. But actually, just the multitude of these retellings um, are very much part of what uh, makes those myths and those legends so fascinating. You'll have a story that has been retold and retold and retold over generations, and it's always fascinating to see what has changed, what is adapted, and what actually remains. And sometimes it's very surprising. Some of the, the, the images we still carry that would actually be very problematic if we started um, thinking about them in a modern uh, perspective, in a feminist uh, perspective, uh, for example. Um, but there are motives there that have stayed over hundreds and hundreds of years and somehow we're still, we're still dealing with them. We're still dealing with the same motives. Well. That, I, I think that's where um, that, that's one of the features of a myth is they have there's a, there's a fundamental core to the myth that keeps it going because it's there's some universal kind of um, value that, that people find in it in every generation. Um, <clears throat> speaking of films, I mean actually the, the character who's appeared in the most films is Sherlock Holmes, and there'd be more versions of Sherlock Holmes than here, so it's kind of it's become a new mythology really. Um, what I find interesting is that where you know in these times when we're kind of there's a lot of talk about cultural appropriation sometimes the fantasy from another country or another culture can be a way in that other ways don't offer um and uh i think i mean when i was a kid um i don't know if you all watched monkey when you were kids oh yeah um and i remember thinking like this was like nothing else we'd seen this was incredible like it was bonkers yeah. um and it 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 you know, there was nothing else about Chinese culture on television. This was just the only thing we'd ever seen. And it was because it was so mad and because you accept it. This is a fantasy. Like, we know it's not real. But there were so many other things going on in within the stories that you're learning about and you're kind of accepting because mm. the story is just a bonkers fantasy story. Um, and I think quite often those aspects of the story become uh, an access point. You yes. know, where we say, well, actually, just as I, you know, we, we step back, we say, okay, I know this isn't real. I know it's a fantasy. So there's an awful lot here I'm not going to get, or it's, it's going to be kind of, you know, maybe unbelievable or unrealistic. Um, and then, you know, with when you find something strange about somebody else's culture, 
that kind of gets blended in and it becomes part of the story and part of the strangeness and part of the appeal of this weird fantasy story. Um, so I think when, when the balance of that is hit, hits right, all of a sudden, instead of being, um, you know, instead of the strangeness of another culture being an obstacle for you understanding it, it becomes part of the appeal of the fantasy story. Um, and it's a very hard balance to strike because I think, you know, going back to what makes a perfect bestseller is, um, quite often it's not an original idea. It's it's a it's a it's a familiar idea told in a new way. Um, yeah. And if you look at you know Twilight or Harry Potter or Hunger Games, these were not original stories, but they were they took something that was kind of universal and they found a new way of telling it. Um, and then everybody's kind of going, "Oh, we've seen all this before." Yeah, but it's a huge success because somehow people connected with it in a way they may not have connected with something that was more original or more pioneering. Um, and I think in some ways, that, you know, that's, that's one of the problems with the pioneers of any genre is that sometimes they're just going, they're, they're too fresh, they're too new or they're too original and people can't connect. They can't kind of relate to stuff. Um, whereas you pull back a little bit and you strike that balance between the familiar and the weird or the familiar and the new. Um, so, um, I mean, I think one of, the, one of the books I read a while back that kind of gave, I felt struck that balance really well was the... Slan, uh, Sladen Ahmed's um, Throne of the Crescent Moon. Yeah. Uh, so it very much uses a kind of a, you know, a standard mm -hmm. epic kind of fantasy tropes and, and storytelling techniques, but he bases it in, his, in, in the Muslim culture. And it's, um, here we go. <laughs> um, so I think that's it. When, when these things are done right, and um, with Irish mythology, um, We've had a kind of a problem with with when it's translated into books because it you know it, it came very much from an oral culture, and um, one book of thing in particular was um, by a guy called Eddie Lennon, who's one of our kind of most kind of seasoned storytellers. The guy's got thousands of stories in his head, but when you read the when you read the book, um, the title's gone out of my head. Um, he it, has a few. It sounds like his voice, but actually it's hard to get that voice down on paper. And too often, for a long time, certainly when I was young, a lot of the, the Irish um, legends were told, it was almost like they were just stuck down on the page. You know, they didn't think about this as being a modern audience. They thought that if you just lay this story out on the page, it's going to be fine. And I think for a long time, they were kind of falling into the gap of going from the point where they were part of a wider culture into something, into publishing. And they weren't adapting to the publishing format. Mm. So a lot of those stories weren't very well told and we were kind of starting to lose them. And then people started to actually say, well, actually, because you you a generation of people who were growing up watching stuff from Britain and America and, and um, you know, all our entertainment was coming from outside. And writers who were kind of becoming established and becoming successful in their own right were then looking at Irish culture and going, well, actually, there's so much good stuff here, but we're not using very much of it. Or we're not telling it for a modern audience. Um, and that's really brought it back. I mean, there's, there's so much more um, stuff being told. <laughs> yes, that's an example. Um, so I think that was the key is, is that we took something that we thought these stories would just travel on their own if you just stuck them on a page instead of saying, well, actually, let's think about the audience now and think about what, how that audience has changed. You know, I rewrote um, The Goblin of Tower, which is a very established Irish myth. And, uh, but actually, there's no twist in it. And, it. and he has a magic spear that solves everything at the end. And we just don't go for that anymore you know it's like i have a magic spear everything's all right um so yeah. i had to i had in it i had to add in a you know an extra stage where he fails first he he's, he fails against the goblin first before he succeeds um and that's such a basic thing now but it wasn't necessary years ago because the storyteller would dress it up you know mm. uh, and now of course we know more about storytelling and we're kind of more deliberate about it, how we structure it so um, and I find that really interesting, kind of how we've kind of adapted these things and say, well, actually, our audience is really savvy about storytelling now. They, you know, they they see so much, they learn so much. Yeah. And we have to meet that demand. We can't just kind of use what what we've seen before. It's fatally easy for stories to get lost. Um, a couple of oh, a year or so ago, um, a friend of mine was um, telling me that she'd met her son who is the same age as mine so early 20s at the time of this story in a cafe 
and they were the only two people in there. So she walked in and said, God, it's like the Mara Celeste in here. And he said to her, what? Like the Mara Celeste? I take it we all know what the Mara Celeste, that reference means something to all of us? Yes. yes. No, cleared the top of her son's head by a good six feet. He had never heard the story. So I came back from coffee with my friend and spoke to both my sons and said, if I said the Mara Celeste to you, what would that mean? Oh, don't know, is she on the telly? And so I started asking teenagers and young 20-somethings what Marie Celeste meant to them. Not a flicker. Because that, for their generation, that has fallen out of current myth. And it's basically easy for those of us who are that bit older, who are very well versed in myths and tales and you know, this whole field, to assume that is universal. To go back to Twilight, um, I was talking, again, conversation with friends, um, one of whom was an English teacher at school, and another friend was saying, oh, but Twilight, it's such tosh, you know, we got all that from Jane Eyre. And the friend who was an English teacher said, yeah, and the girls I'm teaching have never read Jane Eyre. This is all new and interesting, and it's much more accessible to them than Jane Eyre is, that we read at that age, because frankly, there was nothing else to read. Um, but she used Twilight and those books, similar literature, to then introduce the girl to Jane Eyre, the Brontes, you know, and what we now consider great literature. Um, and I think, you know, we, it's important that we remember one of the reasons that myths are continually retold is there is a continually a new generation coming up who have never heard these stories and who deserve to have these stories, but presented in a context that is meaningful and relevant to them. I think there's also an issue with um, every story is told with an agenda. You know, there's always the writer's interpretation and their motives and their reasons for wanting to tell that story. Um, any, any writer who doesn't think they're writing to an agenda um, definitely has an agenda. They just kind of <laughs> think that everybody else has the same one. But um, uh, I'm just trying to think of the example. So, um, oh, well, this is limited I've to completely forgotten it. Um, hmm? This isn't limited to literature. Myth making is drive going on all the time, all around us. Particularly, oh yeah, media, yeah, and particularly uh, in politics. If you look uh, at the way that news coverage of individuals and dramatic stories skews towards mythic archetypes, frequently in a very unhelpful way, particularly when it comes to politics. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and in fact, just to kind of to take a, horror, a historical example, um, I did. A, I wrote a book last year about Alcock and Brand, who were the first to, to travel nonstop, fly nonstop across the Atlantic. And most people would never refer to them um, if you asked. And, and in fact, even now, people have hardly heard of Charles Lindbergh. Actually, you know, kind of the younger generation, I think, is, is not as um, prominent. But if you'd ask most people, people would have said Charles Lindbergh, and he is an iconic figure. You know, he's known for crossing, being the first to cross the Atlantic. And actually, he crossed the Atlantic eight years after Alcock and Brown. He was something like the 90th person to cross the Atlantic, fly across the Atlantic. But he did it on his own. He did it solo. Oh, and he was an American PR. The American PR machine. Yeah. Um, so he had this, you know, he's kind of blotted out the fact. And actually, Alcock and Brown weren't the first to fly across the Atlantic. That was the U.S. Navy. But they didn't fly nonstop. It took them about seven days or eight days. They had to do it in stages with seaplanes. And they had the entire Navy in support. Um, so Alcock and Brown were the first to do it non-stop and um, they did in 16 hours but they've kind of been blotted out you know um because a brighter light has shone since they did it um and again it came down to well who who had the most to gain from telling this story and, and from you know um gaining the credit for it uh and i like the kind of the you know the winner always gets to, to kind of set the story it's a similar thing you know if if somebody tells the message in a stronger way or more powerful way, um, that really affects. And of course, that, that then affects the myths that we're told, the myths that we learn. And we create this myth all the time. Uh, they're very ingrained in, uh, in politics, but in our um, view of the world as well. And I mean, if we're talking about nations, it gets very easy, very uh, fast 
uh, one of the big ones would be a uh, Bastille Day. Um, mm. It's not the meaning it had at the time, it's the meaning you give it. And that's what's going to stay with people. Yeah. Well, one of yeah. the most corrosive influences in the UK at the moment is the myths of the British Empire. Yeah. Which we could talk about for ages, so please, let's not. <laughs> well, I, I think that's, that's true enough. No, that's I, think, okay. I think that's something the far right are very adept at using. I think sometimes when um, you know, kind of the left-leaning um, community would tend to think that reason prevails and that we're rational creatures. And that if you give somebody a good reason for believing something or doing something, then that's what will be most convincing. When actually we've seen that actually it's storytelling and it's myth building that works, and it's repeating the same idea and an idea that kind of um, you know reinforces your opinions or reinforces your your beliefs, your convictions, and that works better. You know. So a, a story with a core message that that um, confirms your belief is more powerful than any kind of rationale. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we, you know, we 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 dismiss we dismiss the power of storytelling at our at our peril. I think it's. I think so. um, it brings us back to the fact that these first myths were devised around the campfires by Homo sapiens or possibly even Neanderthals. Who knows to try to make sense of the world, and that's where you got the gods of thunder and the gods of storm and the gods of flood and the gods of famine. Um, if you look at very early myth cycles, there are these commonalities which are to do with trying to make sense of a dangerous and uncertain world, and that human impulse is alive and kicking today. And exactly as Rosheen says, that is what. Um, <laughs> the yes, it is. ill wishers use to their own advantage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's been a few questions. I mean, somebody was asking how important is place in myth? They, they live in Georgia in the USA, and the Cherokee myths seem to be tied to explanation of place names and how they, they earned them. I mean, uh, you know, in, in Ireland, every field has a name. <laughs> And we've lost a lot of them, but then we get people building estates that are named after the landlord. Well, I'll, I'll give you the, like one of the best examples of that. So um, uh, not far from where I live is a place called the Hill of Ward or Clockta. And Clockta is the, the location with the best claim to the, um, the, sort of the original source of Halloween or the original location of Halloween. Now, how accurate that would be is, is still open to question. And there's some kind of, there would be some kind of, pagan religions who say absolutely this is true there's no question about it and then there are archaeologists who say there's there's reasonable evidence to suppose that it might be true but um certainly it's it's probably got the best claim to being the original location of halloween because it was the first bonfire to be lit back when um the high king lived in the hill of tara and until that bonfire was lit the hill the the bonfire in the hill of Tara, or the bone fires as they would originally have been would would have been um they would have waited for that as a signal before they um, uh, they lit the fires. They lit the next ones, yeah. Yeah. So and there's there's only one of only two four ring forts on this hill. So and it would have been a ceremonial location rather than being a place where people lived, as far as they can tell. And there is um, there is um, evidence that there were fires burned there that was so hot they burned bone. Um, and and kind of change the chemical chemical composition of rock. So these were serious. This was definitely a place where something serious was happening. And the the structure, I think, there's something like four thousand tons of stone in the rings buried under this kind of field. So um, it's definitely a very it's a very significant location. And yet it's been kind of overlooked for years. It's just in a field. Like there's, you know, there's there's nothing around it. And in fact. If even if you look at Tara, you know, Tara, they've got very little to show. It's just some features. It must be very disappointing for any tourists who show up looking for the kind of the location of the High Kings. And the fact was well, a hump there and there's a bit of a ring. And um, so the lock is even worse. It's, it's a deal with some, you know, some humps it and the sheep eating there. Um, and yet it's, you know, Halloween in, in America is a $17 billion industry. Um, so you know, Ireland is really bad at making big fuss about our, our kind of archaeological monuments, um, but it's there's there, there's a book um, I can't remember the name of the Celtic fire fire of the Celtic, um, and it goes through the kind of the the 
the archaeological um, side of the things, but it also looks back at the cultures that would have kind of come one after. Because we talk about Celtic, Celtic culture, but actually there's no Celtic culture. You know, there was a whole series of tribes, none of whom called themselves Celts. Um, and they, you know, one after another, they changed the landscape and they changed things. So um, uh, the, the age of this particular monument stretches over a couple of thousand years. I think that the kind of first stage was started um, and would have been unrecognizable to those who kind of who came later on. Uh, and I think Ireland, yeah, because we have so many, I mean, I remember kind of being in Australia a while back and they had buildings that were like 200 years old. And I was going, really? You know, <laughs> you know that's really <laughs> old. Um, and yet at the same time, the culture that I think, as far as I know, can trace itself back in a continuous line further back than any other culture. Um, they had a bowl, actually, they, not it wasn't a bowl, but they had an area where they where the um, um, the native Australians danced in the same place for so long that they'd worn out a bowl in the rock wow. um, because they came back every year, and there was a kind of a, there was a depression in solid stone because the feet had worn it down over a thousand years, you know. So I think the place is very much woven into um, the location, or, or sorry, the the kind of the the shape or color of mythology. Um, but at the same time, some stories are universal and, 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 and like Halloween, Halloween is basically a harvest festival. You know, it's, it's the fear of death heading into winter. And now there's a version of that, I think probably in every culture because it's such a core thing. It's such a universal thing. Um, somebody asked, asked how much does post-colonial development of Irish myths play a part? But Jean, you were about to say something. Um, just that it's always very interesting when there's a place, a recognizable place to a myth. And sometimes the place will create the myth, mm. uh, the giant's causeway. Of course, someone has had to build that. It's so obvious. And sometimes the myth creates the place and you have a story and then you start tying that to a place and the place becomes uh, mythical, which is kind of what happened um, in, um, in what I'm going to read um, at half past six, where you have this foundation legend and there is that character that disappears and then progressively there's different ways um, she could have disappeared and suddenly you start using the castle well that actually isn't old enough to be part of that myth and then that becomes a mythical uh, place in itself. So it can go in any way, but it's always interesting. Mm. Yeah. Um, there's another couple of questions here, apart from the, uh, um, um, but isn't the success of these myths and retelling their plot, isn't this the success of these myths and retelling their plot? I know that's a very narratological view. I'm not sure what that. Um, that sounds and, like a comment rather than the question. Yeah, and is, is uh, I think it was related to discussions we were having and, and cultural shortcuts. Some people find myths easier to connect with because they already know what these things are. But then you think about the success of Cartoon Saloon, who are bringing stories that like are very Irish in, 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 in manner. Yeah, well, I, um, think, I think the whole idea of kind of Celtic mythology is a shortcut because it is, it is such a kind of complicated mess. And there's an awful lot we still don't know much about. You know, we can't we have names for some of the series of tribes who arrived from places like Spain and Germany. Um, and uh, it's kind of, we've had to come up with a, a single kind of strands that goes all the way back that we can kind of label. Um, and I think there's probably no harm in that. You need to kind of, you need a way for people to get, you know, there are scholars who spend their whole lives studying some small part of these things. So we can't expect everybody to just go, well, yeah, I know every, you know, I know all 13 tribes that arrived before 1000 BC. Um, so um, I think that's fair enough. And I, I think sometimes people are very hard on, on um, when, you know, when you get to the, you're not exactly accurate or you kind of, you have some misunderstanding. I think, you know, we're not historians or anthropologists, or most of us aren't historians or anthropologists or archeologists. So we have to have ways of referring to this stuff without, you know, somebody cutting your head off or getting it wrong. Yeah, um, there's, a, there was, there's a question here and, and I, I'm gonna add a little to it. And what do the panel think of the um, the treatment of Norse myths by Marvel, Marvel Comics? And I'm gonna throw in Banshee, the Irish myth <laughs> treatment as well, because that's a- he, The guy called Banshee. Is a guy called Remember? Banshee, like, oh. Um, 
I don't know who wants to start on that. Um, <laughs> That's a long conversation that I think needs a panel of its own. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I think part of you know part of me think yeah they, they borrowed from everywhere but then on the other hand you know that's that's what stories do um and sometimes that's it just creates a little opportunity for people to take an interest in something i mean the, the samurai for instance is a good example of you know how many different ways of the samurai being nicked for other stories and and yet actually it's 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 a way for people that kind of prompts people to take an interest and in, deeper interest in these things so sometimes i think it's um, I mean, the, the, there are so many things that have been taken from Irish culture and used in, you know, in American stories and films or even in British stories and films. And part of me, I, I don't get offended easily, but um, I do think sometimes it is, an, it is a kind of an opening that, that creates the possibility of further study or further interest, you know. Um, I mean, there are people who travel to another country because of something they saw mm. um, in a film or a television or a book. So... Um, you know, we, we have to include this stuff. And I think, again, it makes it accessible and it makes it inclusive, of, even, if it, even if you get it wrong. You know, I mean, it's, I think it's important to be, just, to be respectful to the source. Um, but, Respect is key. Hmm? Respect is absolutely key to this yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. And so, but it, yeah. and that can be hard. It can be hard to get right. Um, so, but Marvel have just kind of... <laughs> I mean, they've borrowed well, they've from everything. Their own mythology. Yeah, they've created their own mythology, which mm. can quite happily stand yeah, yeah. alongside and parallel to the sources. Um, uh, yeah, I don't think one necessarily contaminates the other. Um, yeah, they have I to call it a mythology. And they've created a universe, they've created a framework, but part of what makes mythology is how many people have told and retold the stories, mm. have put so many things in it for, for generations and generations. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, uh, these things do change over time anyway, and they are all mm. interpretations of interpretations of interpretations. Mm. Um, so I think I think sometimes people can get very offended about something. Well, actually, you're that thing that's been thousand, interpreted a thousand times, you can't take that and interpret it again. Um, you know, it's very hard to be the guardian of truth when you're talking about something we don't even know where it came from. Um, yeah. But at the same time, yeah, when it when it's when it's emotionally when the, when there's a kind of a community with an emotional investment in this story, um, then that's something you have to be respectful of. Uh, and you know, the Irish have, have been on both ends of this. Um, you know, we've certainly had a lot of stuff borrowed from us, and we've also had borrowed a lot of other people's stuff. So. And it uh, can get even more complicated when the mythology you're using um, is still an active religion. Um, I talked about Christian myth mythology a few times, and it's a very fascinating mythology. It's a very fascinating uh, collection of stories. But yes, uh, you do have to know that those stories mean a lot to many, many people. And so be careful how you use them. Father, did you have something? Um, just, to, just to say that um, Marvel, in a way, are the their universe is the opposite of a mythology in that it, it it belongs to very specific people rather than to anyone who 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 wants to tell it. So in, in that way, it's 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 sort of an opposite. I mean, you do see kids telling each other about Batman and Spider Man. So in a way, it is a, a sort of a living oral tradition, except that you've got the concept of canon. And and because you have the concept of canon, I, I don't believe it's 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 an actual uh, it's an actual real mythology, although it might become so in future. I think, it's starting, those I think that's I think it's starting to escape from them because they've become so widespread. I mean, one of the things, for instance, to be relevant to me is that I'm always interested when I see artists drawing characters from Marvel and doing commissions, like taking out commissions that you know getting paid to draw a character that they've never worked on or they've never been kind of licensed to use by Marvel. And it became so widespread that Marvel have basically, I think, given up on trying to control all this because what are they going to do? They're going to sue everybody who ever draws Spider-Man. Um, and I think that's how it's starting to kind of bleed out, you know? And you also have, you, you, we constantly have stories that break canon, you know, that kind of go outside of canon. And now normally they're licensed, um, but you also have the idea of fan fiction, and fan fiction yeah. is another thing where it's just kind of being pulled out of the control of the creator, and, and people are doing something new with. 
And I think when you create something that's so, it's so compelling that people feel driven to do make their own material, kind of create their own stuff from it. Um, that's where, you know, the strength of the story shows and it, it starts to become something out of control of the original source, really, or out of kind of disconnected from the original source. Okay, we're nearly out of time. Um, Juliet, did you have something to add? No, uh, point to already, uh, what I was going to say has been said. <laughs> okay. Um, there was one last question, and I think it's more of a statement. Uh, I'm going to leave it as a statement because we don't really have enough time to discuss it. That if we don't have a shared mythological reference, then how does that contribute to the relationship and, and fragmentation of our society and our ability to communicate with each other? You know, it is important to have myths that, that talk to us all, but it's also important to learn myths from somebody else. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And those, um, it's a very important thing to have that framework uniting us as long as we can stay critical of it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of myths in common. Uh, I mean, Halloween would be one example. Valor of the Evil Eye is another one. I think most, a lot of mythology have the idea of somebody who can, who can hurt with a stare. So you've got Medusa, you've got others. Um, and um, I remember being contacted by a guy back in Spain who was kind of studying this and he'd, he'd seen a book that I'd done and he was just exploring this idea of the evil eye or somebody, and somebody who can hurt just with a stare. Um, and that's something that seems to be very widespread. So I think there, there are kind of universal ideas within all of these myths that, like the flood, you know, there's a flood yeah. um, myth in, in, all, in every culture. Um, so these things are, are kind of, they are, they're something that unite us when we see the roots of them. Well, of course, the Romans in particular sort of went stooging around uh, any bit of land they fancied and would say, oh, you have a lightning god. Oh, that's clearly just your name for Jupiter. Yeah. As far as they, they were concerned, they were all the same. OK, um, we're out of time. Thank you all very much, Juliet, Heather, Jean and Oshin for joining us for this panel. Mm -hmm.